Okay, we're going to get started now for the fly tying portion. Pat Dorsey is going to be doing the demonstration tonight. Uh, Pat's a native of Colorado and has been uh, guiding for nearly, what, 30 years now? Yes, sir. Uh, he spends well over 200 days a year on the water, a combination of guiding customers, hosting destination travel trips, and personal days on the water for himself. Pat is the head guide and co-owner of the Blue Quill Angler Fly Shop in Evergreen, Colorado. He also maintains an online uh, stream report uh, that monitors stream flows and conditions for the Blue, Colorado, South Platte, and uh, North Fork of the South Platte and the Williams Fork Rivers. He's authored the books of Fly Fishing Guide in the Small Platte River, in the South Platte River, Fly Fishing Tailwaters, Tying and Fishing Tailwaters Flies. Pat is an accomplished fly tire and has originated several very effective patterns such as the Mercury Series, UV Scud, Limeade, Cherry Limeade, Paper Tiger, Top Secret, and many others. He once produced over 28,000 flies in a year. Uh, Pat is a fly designer for Umqua Feather Merchants. His signature flies are available at the Blue Quill Angler and other specialty fly shops throughout the U.S. Pat is also a protein member for Whiting Farms, and many of his flies incorporate Whiting Farm products. Pat, all yours. Thank you so much. I'll tell you, as ironic as it sounds, the last show that I did was your club last year. Wow. And that was, and then that's when whirling, or not whirling disease, that's when <laughs> COVID hit. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. And that was uh, right after Super Bowl Sunday. Well, maybe this is a good book in. Well, I hope this, right. is, this is awesome. Yeah, I hope it this is, is uh, the end of it. When Jack invited me to, to, to come out after I was at the Brewfest, I was so excited. And, you know, the Brewfest was the first presentation that I've done, you know. So it's, it's kind of crazy. It's, um, it's nice to have a sense of normalcy coming back, although we're all being very, very careful. It's, it is nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. And uh, thanks for everybody that's, that's watching tonight via Zoom. I appreciate you. The attendance. So I'm going to tie up some of my favorite midge patterns. This evening our presentation is on western tailwaters, so I'd like to kind of circle around and tie some flies that would be effective for those as well. So we're going to start out with uh, one of my favorite midge of larva patterns. The thing about my flies is they're not going to win fly tying contests. They're, they're simple, effective, but they're actually true guide flies, and that's what's important. They're simple, but effective. Um, midge larvae are typically found in a pale olive or red color. They're very uniform throughout their worm-like bodies. And this one here, this is a TMCO 2487, and it is a uh, eight-aught light Cahill thread. And we're going to take a piece of clear microtubing. Typically, I tie these midge larvae in size. 16 and 18, typically bigger than the pupa. As they go through their life cycle, they actually downsize one size. So a larva that's an 18 would be a pupa, would be a 20 and a 22 for an adult. And it seems kind of crazy, but that's the way that they go through the actual life cycle. So we'll begin with a little jam knot there, and then we're going to secure this clear tubing in place and use symmetrical wraps as we advance this thread back towards hook bend. As I mentioned a moment ago, the characteristic of a midge larva is that thin, uniform, tube-like, worm-like body. And so I started putting these on to simulate that actual emerging appearance, and it just becomes a trigger. It helps separate your fly from the crowd, if that makes sense. So this is a Timco 200R, typically tie them in sizes 18 and 20. It's an extra small glass bead and I'm using 8-aught uni thread for the tying thread and then small UTC gold wire for the rib. And we'll begin behind the bead with symmetrical wraps back towards hook bend, just trying to create that smooth and uniform body once again. And then just keep advancing that thread right back towards the bend there and then we're going to move this thread forward 
right back towards the bee. Red larva is a great attractor in a tandem nymphy rig. I use it a lot of times for my attractor. I'll run a red larva and then maybe a pupa behind it during the height of a midge hatch. Very, very deadly tactic. We're going to reverse rib or counter rib this to create a little bit of segmentation. Also will help keep this fly very durable. Again, very simple, very effective. And then I'm going to take a little bit of peacock curl and produce a nice little fluffy collar here. Typically pull it from the, I like the eyes, a little fluffier, tie it in tip first. I'm going to take several turns here to produce a nice little full collar. It's going to help simulate that head area, breathe a little bit of life there with that collar. A great thing to have on your tying bench is a black sharpie pin. So I'm using red thread and I can just finish that off. Works great like when you're dubbing a hair's ear and you're using tan thread and you want to finish it off with black. And then we'll just whip finish this. So typically tie these and 20s and 22s. You can go up to an 18 if you want. But that'll just finish off nice and smooth there. Clip off that tag in. So there you have just a pattern that I refer to as a mercury blood midge. So there's a pale olive larva and a red larva. Very simple but effective patterns that'll work well just about on any tailwater anywhere in the country. Uh, I've got a quick question. Yes, sir. I go just to where it starts to, um, just a little bit past hook bend there, or, uh, or hook point, excuse me. So we're going to go, here's hook point right there, and we're going to go just a little bit past hook point. Hopefully that helps clarify that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Now, when we get to the intermediate stage in the life cycle of a midge, we can uh, really rely on observation for this. And once we determine that a hatch is in progress, that's when the tactics really change with regard to switching from larva to pupa and more so fishing mid-column. The thing about midge pupa is too much weight is as problematic as not enough, if that makes sense. You can literally be fishing below the fish because you have too much weight on it. And the guides on the San Juan River are proven that over and over and over again. They fish with like, you know, size seven split shots, size eight split shots, and they're not big fans of the multiple tungsten putties like we use back home. So it's very important to determine what part of the zone these fish are feeding in and then make the appropriate adjustments with your weight and your indicator. As ironic as it might sound, for me, when I'm midge fishing, I'll make 10 times the adjustment with my indicator and my weight in comparison to flies. A lot of people, if they're not having the success that they're looking for, have a tendency to switch the fly. They think they have the wrong fly, but more times they have the wrong depth or the wrong weight. So that's very, very important. So once you determine that you have a midge hatch in progress, it's time to switch from larvas to pupas and then fish mid column. This is one of my signature series here. This is called a Mercury Black Beauty. This is tied on a size um, 18 down to a 24 TMCO 101. In the spring, this time of year, late February, early March, we begin to see what I refer to as the big spring midge. It's a size 18. It's really gigantic on the South Platte in comparison to some of the other midges that we see, 22s and 24. So when you see the big midge, a lot of people confuse it with a blue wing olive. 
but the important thing is, is that you need to upsize your pupa to accommodate this bigger midge. Does that make sense? So it's not that you always have to tie your midges small. Sometimes you've got to tie them a little bigger, size uh, 18, all the way down to 24, 26. So again, Temco 101, size 18 through 24. It's an extra small glass bead, and this is an 8 aught black thread. And the rib is going to be a UTC copper, size small. We'll begin by securing the copper wire in place, advancing the thread back towards hook bin. Unlike our larvae that have little thin uniform segmented tube-like bodies like we discussed a moment ago, the pupa on the other hand has a robust thorax that contains the wings and the legs of the adult. So it's very important that we simulate that with a little bit of dubbing, which we'll do after I reverse rib this with the copper wire. We're going to take a couple material locking wraps here to secure the wire in place. Trim that off, you can helicopter it off, whatever makes sense for you. We're going to use a little piece of fine and dry black, super fine. I prefer super fine over stuff with guard hairs. It's just easier to work with. And this will fill in that area behind the bead. Put just a tiny bit more on there. It's tricky to see on that black surface. Do a little whip finish. And you have a beautiful little beach pupa once again with the glass bead to help simulate that emergence. Uh, Pat, do you uh, uh, cut your wire with the same scissors you use to cut your material? I do. I, I cut the wire with the same scissors that I do. You know, you can helicopter it off, or you can, you know, go back into the into the. Don't use the tip, you know, that's the part that you always, you know, cut precision stuff with, so I wouldn't recommend that, but I do. Okay. A lot of people just helicopter off, a lot of people go in there. Um, I use the same pair. This is an old pair of Sologen uh, scissors, they're made in Germany. You can't even buy these anymore, but I've been, I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff that I tie on here, these tops and bobbins, they're 50 years old. I mean, I got them when I was a kid, and they, these scissors, been tying on this same pair of scissors for 30 years. Isn't that crazy? That's I mean, great. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we're going to move into another one of my favorite pupa patterns, and it's called the Top Secret Bitch. And it's a pattern that's um, worked well for people all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. I know it works well here on the Guadalupe. It's just one of my go to uh, small flies. I tie it on a Tiemco 2488. It's a, it's a wide gape hook with a shorter shank. And I think that really helps with regard to the hook set, particularly on small ones. And I'll tie this all the way down to a size 26. So during the dead of the winter, when things get really technical, it's not uncommon for us to have to drop down to a 24 or 26 to catch those fish. It's crazy. The South Platte is uh, received more pressure in the last year with regard to COVID. I've seen more anglers than I've ever seen in my life and the fish are getting smarter and more educated. So the thing that we can do is we can drop our fly sizes down and we can drop our tippet size down to common. What size tippet do you use on a 26 or 8 fly? Most of the time 6X nylon tippet is what I use on those. My dry flies, my small dries, then I typically go to a 7X. So size uh, tip code review, 2488, size 18 for the bigger spring midges all the way down to a 26. We're going to begin with a jam knot behind the eye. This is a dark brown 8 dot uni thread. And the rib 
is going to be a piece of 6 aught white thread. I'm going to use two different colors of thread to tie this fly. And I'm going to take this thread and just run it along the top of the spine of this hook, right back towards hook bend. And I'm going to advance this thread forward once again. back up towards that eye and that thorax area. Rather than reverse rib this, I'm going to take this and wrap it in the same direction as I wrap the tying thread. I'm trying to create a nice segmented body that looks very similar to a quill. The hardest thing about the top secret bitch is getting that body to look even and uniform. And the trick to that is, is not reverse ribbing it, using a separate piece of thread for each fly that you tie, because the second time that you handle that thread, it spreads it out. Does that make sense? It's, it's not going to stay tight. Is that a flat thread? It's just a, it's just a, just a regular old, yeah, it's just uni thread. It's um, nothing special about it. I, I wouldn't use the, the Danville thread. Um, I would use it. This is works the best, and it's one size bigger, so it's a six dot versus an eight dot. But if you just take off like four or five inches and then discard that, I mean, we're talking, you know, a tenth of a cent worth of thread, so don't worry about the waste on that. But if you want to get a nice segmented body, that's, that's the key there. Then uh, the wing is a material called Glamour Madura. And it's actually a, a sewing embroidery thread that I use on a lot of my midges. I'm going to take a little piece of that and just drop that right in on the... And it, it's a... I'm going to hold this up here just so everybody can see that. It's kind of got a of focus there, but that's what it's called. It's called Glamour Madeira. Yeah. And um, there's the lot number. Size 8 and 2400, prism white. You should be able to locate this in a, in a sewing shop or online somewhere. But it really works great for emerging wings and little mayfly mergers, RS2s and stuff like that. Like the Black Beauty, the next step is going to be to build up that thorax area. And we'll use some rust brown, super brown, or rust brown, super fine dubbing here. Just build that up. Simulate that thorax area there. Don't want to get too carried away, just want that little hint of that bulbous thorax. Snip that off. And the next thing, pull that wing forward. I think the most important part now is to tease that wing out. Get it to where it looks like a little emerger. Once again, fishing this mid column. Don't be afraid to even grease this and fish it in the surface film. It can be fished as a true emerger. But it's a steadily uh, color possibilities or are olive, chartreuse, red, black. The brown and white has truly been my best producer over the years. But don't be afraid to do some experimentation as well. Any questions on that one? That is truly one of my top guide flies right there. I use that almost every single day this time of year on our tailwater fisheries. Pat, do you make a distinction between I, you know, we fish our coronamids just, I mean, I, I think of coronamids uh, is the, the big lake midges. And that's, that's kind of, you know, we fish, we see, you know, some 14s on our lakes back home. But most of the stuff on the still water, um, I don't know, I just call them midges. And then, I, I, for some reason, when we get to the lakes, we call them coronamids. And then they're pretty much all the same thing, you know what I mean? So, um, kind of a uh, goofy answer, but that's, that's how it is. Anybody at home have any questions? Good, we'll move on to the next one.
Then, probably the most exciting thing is uh, when they actually switch to feeding on the midges on the surface. That's, that's when things get real fun and real technical too. A lot of times we fish in long leaders, you know, 10, 12 foot leaders, fishing with 7x tippet and just require really, really precise casting at that point in time. And that's what really will bring the best of us out of us as a dry fly angler. Uh, one of my favorite adult midge patterns is uh, called Matt's Midge, and I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it or not, but it's named after a young man named Matt Miles, who I met on the Williams Fork River when he was 18 years old, and uh, I was guiding on the Williams Fork all the time, and, and I noticed that this young man was always fishing, and more importantly, that he was always catching. He, he, he was just, the kid was well beyond his abilities for his age, and eventually talked to him, and uh, I ended up hiring him as a young man, and uh, 30 years later, we're the bestest of friends ever. He lives in, in Lynchburg, but he worked for us for a long time, and we stay in touch. This is a Timco uh, 101. Typically tie these in sizes 18 down to a 24 for the reasons that we discussed a bit ago, the bigger spring midges all the way down to the little teeny midges. Uh, we're going to begin with a little bit of uh, black eight on thread. And then we're going to create a nice little abdomen just out of tying thread. So we'll take these symmetrical wraps right back towards hook bend and then we'll advance the thread back forward. And we'll use a little tiny piece of Zelon for the wing here. Matt's midge imitates a, a newly hatched midge. And we'll take a little piece of zeal on there and tie that into the wing. We got one. It's not there it is. I told you, Jeff, this camera's just too good. Yeah. <laughs> See everything. You gotta be careful. I mean. And then we're going to take a little piece of hackle now. And we're going to tie this in traditional dry fly style, which means the both side is up. And then we're going to wrap this hackle forward a few turns there, one more turn. Bring that up here. Take a couple more. Material locking wraps there. Snip that off. Quick finish. Pull that little wing up, and I tend to clip it about even with the back side of that abdomen right there. There you have it. That's a pretty fly. Simple, but effective. And I'll tell you what, Matt Miles hit it out of the park with this one. This is a very, very deadly. Yeah. He, uh, he designed it on the San Juan River, uh, for the San Juan when he was living here, and uh, which is uh, just a great little pattern. And he also ties a little piece of uh, fly lawn in there, Cerise, and he has a high vis variation as well, so it works out real good. I'm working on a new book project now. It's called uh, Favorite Flies for Colorado. Uh, I've got 50 different flies in it from all the local experts, and this is one of them because I think it's one of the best flies for western tailwaters, particularly Colorado. So I'm real excited. I'm going to have that hopefully be on shelves by next fall. So What's not, not this coming fall, fall, but the following fall. What's that? What is the name of this fall? This is called Matt's Midge. Okay. Yep, it was uh, invented after Matt Miles. So that's a single newly hatched midge with a down wing, and so the trout will key in on that silhouette of that down wing. It's surprising. Sometimes if you don't have that silhouette of that down wing, they won't eat it. And that sounds far-fetched. I've seen it too many times. So now we're going to tie a midge cluster. So we just tied... Yes, sir. Fire away. Uh, yes, sir. What's the difference? Or explain the little person. 
They're all very similar in many ways. Uh, you know, the, the Darlon, the Zelon, and the Antron, very, very similar. Uh, poly might be just a little bit softer, but overall, if, you know, Zelon, Darlon, any of that stuff will work just fine for this wing. I like the wing to be just a little bit more on the coarse side as opposed to the soft side so that it just floats better. Does that make sense? So that's kind of kind of what we have. I hope that answers your question. How many of you fished the bighorn before? You ever been up on the bighorn? I'll tell you, one day uh, my wife and I were, were coming down through Three Mile and I actually have the photo in my presentation for this evening. And we were coming down in the snag hole from Three Mile and I was rowing and my wife was fishing and I come around the corner and all I could see was midges on the water. Everywhere. And they were clustering up. And we were in the right place at the right time that day. And uh, this typically happens, you know, mid-April. It's just about the time when the babies are going to start to really get going up in there. But if you've ever experienced midge clusters on the bighorn, you'll have clumps of them about the size of a dinner plate right next to your boat. And they're crawling all over the place. And they're, they're, they're mating, basically. And so you get these big clumps. But every now and then, you'll get a piece about the size of a, uh, like a popcorn, a piece of popped popcorn will break off and float down, and the fish will come up and eat the whole deal. And you'll see similar type midge clusters on the San Juan. I'm sure you've ex been experienced to that as well. So. In addition to having the individual midges, you need to have some clusters too. And so there's a lot of different clusters that can be tied up, but one of my favorites is just the Griffith gnat. It's great. And to separate myself from the crowd, I like to tie a high-vis variation of it, because it can be hard to see your fly out there when there's that many midges. And like I said, when we get to that photo, I'm gonna show it to you. There's, there's midges all over the water, and uh, there's even midges on the fish's jaw right next to the fly that you took. It's pretty cool. Um, so this is a Timco 101, and I would tie these, you know, 16s and 18s for your clusters. The cool thing about a Griffith gnat now is you can imitate smaller midges with it as well. So if you want to tie it down to a 20 or 22 or even a 24, and that works well too. So. We're going to begin with a little piece of, you can use a cerise, you can use pink, you can really use any color you want for the wing. And this is going to be similar to tying in a parachute post right here. We'll anchor those butt ends down, and then we're just going to take this and prop this up. Put a little thread wedge right in front there, and then we'll just bundle this up. This takes a little practice, but if you do a few of them, you get pretty darn good at it. We'll leave that rascal just sticking straight up like that. If you've ever been exposed to these midge clusters, pretty cool. I mean, they're just crawling all over all each other and stuff, and it, it just creates a lot of movement. So the peacock, I tend to oversize it just a little bit to help simulate some of that movement. And then I use a, a lot of hackle. So we're going to tie in two tips of the peacock curl here, and then we'll extend those right back towards the fin. And then we're going to take another piece of uh, this Whiting Farms Grizzly and tie it in once again, uh, dull side up, which is a conventional dry fly. And when I, when I refer to conventional dry fly, I mean to where the hackle is going forward as opposed to going back like you would do on a soft hackle. Does that make sense? So now we'll take this here and we're going to Wrap this forward. Pull that wing out of the way there. Sneak a couple in front of the wing there. A lot of times people ask me, you know, why don't you use uh, strong hurl? 
Well, I find that the strong hurl gets crammed in a bag and it just loses a lot of its fluffiness, so I don't like to use that. A lot of people ask me why I don't tie it in butt first, the butt end of the, the <coughs> peacock hurl. The butt end of that, that peacock hurl is much wider on the stem, and when you wrap it forward, it has a tendency to mash the fibers down, so you lose your fluffiness of that too. So that's why I tend to like the, uh, the eyes um, another reason that I like the eyes is Mother Nature sized this for us. You can see there's some really big ones up on the top end of this feather, right here, and then as I move down the feather, they get a little smaller. <coughs> and if I get real picky with my selection of this stuff, you can see I even have some even smaller ones here. This camera is just so powerful, but there's really smaller pearl at the base of the stem, and as you go up, you get thicker. So it's pretty slick the way that works. Now we're going to take this and wrap this forward. I tend to really get after it on the hackle here because I want to simulate that movement. So I'm putting a ton of hackle in there. Move that wing out of the way there. Material lock and wraps there. Come back there. Got a couple stragglers there, but don't worry too much about that. You can always come back and get those buggers out of there down the road. Don't we'll finish it. Straggler, we'll just rest our scissors on our thumb there and we we'll just take care of those buggers like that. And then what I do is I come and I trim this wing just like that and then I just kind of flatten it out a tiny bit. That's a beautiful little fly. You yeah, can see that it looks great. Foam lines. Uh, you can see it in harsh glare. You can use this as a locator fly. That's the beautiful thing. If you want to drop a smaller beach behind it and, a, and somewhere, you can see this one and then you know you've got your, low, your smaller bug behind it. Uh, it's just a deadly, all-purpose midge imitation. What did you say that material is on the post? This is, uh, this is just, a, again, just some uh, like Darlon or Zelon. Oh, okay. Yeah, like Flylon. There's all, they're all basically the same, same thing. That, was popularized by uh, John Betts, you know, a Denver-based tire that really started the synthetics, you know, the uh, surge of synthetics back in the day. So we just uh, we just tied the whole midge life cycle. I mean, we did larva, red, pale olive, a couple pupa, a single adult, and a, and a cluster. And as simple as that is, I feel confident that you can take those flies and catch fish just about anywhere in the western U.S. Now we're kind of getting on that front edge of uh, blue-wing olives. Yeah, good. Um, you know, for us in the Rockies, when, when we start to see the uh, first mayflies of the year, we really start to get fired up, you know, because that's when spring is sprung. And, and uh, you guys know all about this uh, latest Arctic blast too well. So do we. Uh, we had a lot of cold just like you did. Um, the beauty of it, we were able to fish right on through it because we have our tail water, so that was really nice. But, uh, we've had uh, low flows and we've had cold weather. I've been, I've been doing a lot of guiding this year. Without the show season, I've been guiding almost every day. So I've been blessed from the standpoint of lost all the show season. That's why I'm so grateful to be here tonight. But you have the ability to guide. So it's been, it's been special. But as we get into the uh, shoulder seasons, we're going to start to see those olives, blueing olives, and that's typically when the water temperature starts to get to that 42 degree range. And I'm going to tie a couple patterns that I think will be uh, very beneficial for you. And this is called a uh, mercury pheasant tail. This is a um, Kimco 101. Again, putting an extra small glass bead on there. And we're going to begin with some 8-aught black thread. 
We take a few fibers of pheasant tails here. I typically tie this in a size of 16 all the way down to a 24. I like to tie the colors in various colors. For instance, right now, if you come to Colorado and you're out fishing and you're going to look down on the snow and you're going to see a bunch of little black stone flies crawling all over the snow. And it's, it's called a, a winter stone. And you can tie a size 18 black pheasant tail, just like this, and it's a perfect little stone fly nymph for a winter stone. Isn't that crazy? So it shows you the versatility of a pheasant tail nymph just in various colors. That's the beauty of the PT. You can tie it in um, you know, yellow for your pale morning duns, olive for your betas, and so on and so forth. So typically, on your pheasant tail nymphs, you want your tail to be about two-thirds of a shank length long. Typically, I'm going to use four or five fibers for this. And then I'm going to use some fine wire. Finest wire that you can get for the segmentation on this because I want to create some durability and just a little hint of segmentation. I'm going to take those original fibers there, go back to the tie in point, and then advance those fibers right up towards that thorax area. Grab our wire now and we're going to reverse rib. Just like that. Then we're going to split these fibers here. And I like to have two on either side, so I got five in there. So we're going to take two in the front two on the rear there. And I typically like to use a little piece of Mylar tinsel for the wing case on this. And I'll tie this right behind the bead there. Oops. And we'll advance that right back till about the 50% point on that shank there. Well, it looks like an awful big fly. Clear, I can't count either. Okay, now we're the T on either side. Then we're going to take our peacock curl once again from the eye. And then I usually do about seven turns. I like to have a nice fluffy thorax. I don't know about you guys, but I like just a real fluffy. I didn't even count that. It looks good to me though. Then we'll pull this little piece of mylar tinsel right over the top here. Take a couple. one leg that doesn't want to behave itself there. Snip that off. You can adjust those with the thread tension to try to get those where you want them. And then we finish. So again, in a wide range of sizes and colors, you know, from that ginger, yellow color, brown, olive, black, natural. Gosh, I mean, you can tie just about any mayfly nymph you want with, with pheasant tail fibers. And I'm going to trim these legs, and then I'm going to tilt this in the vise just a little bit here so you can kind of get an idea what it looks like from the top side. So it's, it's a deadly little pattern, and we all know, you know, this was a pattern that Frank Sawyer designed back in, you know, the late... 20s, 1929, I believe, and it was just tied with thread, and, or no thread, it was just wire and pheasant tail back to the original one, believe it or not, but it's, 
a great one. Do you ever put anything on the, on the wing case? I don't, but you could. You could put, uh, you know, some epoxy on there to really highlight that if you wanted to. I usually don't. I, I, most of the flies that I tie, I just kind of consider them to be disposable <laughs> because they're so fast. And uh, you can crank these things out. If you lose one in a tree, no big deal. If a trout takes it, no big deal. It seems to always hurt a little more when you lose them in a tree, though, doesn't it? <laughs> you don't mind losing one. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to tie one more if that's okay with everybody. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm having a blast again. Thank you. So uh, this is a pattern that uh, a fellow by the name of Rim Chung invented. Oh, yeah. It's an RS2. Everybody's heard of this one before, right? Right. And uh, it, it's a pattern that's evolved over the years. To, you know, his original pattern, and this is a, a variation of it that was designed by Bob Churchill, one of our guides at the Blue Quill. And it's called the Sparkle Wing RS2. And uh, to date, it's probably my favorite. I have caught fish all over the world with this fly. Believe it or not, down in Argentina, it works very well. And that's crazy. Um, you know the accent. The accent down there is in Argentina. Sometimes it's hard to understand the guys, but I love those guys. They're like my brothers. We become almost family. But the first time I went down there, one of the guys was telling me about a fly called a poop of John, and I didn't know what he was talking about because of his <laughs> his accent. And and then I finally figured out that he was talking about John Bar's copper John. And uh, but the RS2 was the same thing. I mean, it, they were familiar with a Copper John and an RS2, and uh, it's pretty amazing. So um, this is a Timco 101. You can kind of see a pattern here. I really like you know, 2488s, Timco 101s a lot for these, these small flies. And this is an 8-aught gray uni thread. And then I'm going to use uh, some medium done hackle for the tail. There's a lot of different ways that you can tie the tail, and you'll see uh, people going as far as uh, tying, you know, with micro five ants and then splitting them, which is a beautiful, you know, propping them up and that um, with it is, is really, really nice. But I found when I was a commercial tire that I just was uh, trying to find ways that I could produce good flies that were durable and looked well, and, and this is kind of what we were doing in the day was just tying a, a tail out of these done apple fibers here. Looks like that. I got a straight one there. That. Probably the biggest tip that I can share with you this evening on an RS2 is to make sure that you keep it thin and sparse because bulky imitations just don't fish the same as thin and sparse one. So the, the dubbing of this, and we've all been taught this before, you take the amount of dubbing you think you need to cut it in half. You know, and it's we've all been suspect of using too much dubbing. It's it's really easy to do. So what I do when I dub is uh, I'll take just a few fibers and they're so thin, see that just right where the eye of the hook is there? That's going to be the end of my dubbing noodle. And I'm not kidding you, that's like two or three dub fibers. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start here, and we're just going to wrap that up there. That's going to start. We've got one little straggler up there, but I think we can work around that. So that, that beginning part of that dubbing noodle, right there, is barely thicker than the thread. And this camera is so good that 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 body looks thick, and I'm here to tell you with the naked eye, that thing is thin. <laughs> but that is, you can tell by the hook gate there, and you can tell how thin that body is. But did, I don't know if you saw how just that first couple fuzzes is all you need. They're just barely thicker than the thread. Then the wing is a flat ribbon braid. Lay this right in behind the eye there. And I like to have a nice full wing here. So I just kind of, let's redo that again just so you can see. I tie it in, pull it forward, and then kind of scoot it back. Tie it right there. Hopefully my fingers weren't in the way. But 
probably the most important thing is getting that wing full. Don't shortchange yourself on that because you're imitating that sailboat look as an emerging mayfly. Come in and clip that wing off. One of the most important things, I've heard this a few times too, is don't crowd the head, right? <laughs> like Dane there just did. Now you got the you got the, the, the taper part here, which is the beautiful part. Now we're just gonna come back in and we're just gonna lay a little bit of dubbing here. Just like that. Right back to the wing and then come right back forward. Just like that. After you tie a few of those, you'll know exactly how much dubbing you need. And you'll just whip finish. Now this you can tie in a lot of different colors too. Olive, black, purple, I mean you name it. You can really tie it. But again, the, the probably the most important thing here is just having that nice little full wing, real sparse body. Thank you so much. I'd like to donate these to the club. Oh, great. And so uh, you guys can... I don't know, do a little raffle with them or do something. So. I did them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most, most of the RS2s that I see are tied just with thread, no dubbing. Yep. Good way, too. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know if you've got something to put those in, Jeff. Yeah, we'll, we'll find something. Anybody at Zoom have a question? What kind of pocket here? You're, you're all uh, muted, so you need to unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate everybody. Okay. Uh, Zoom audience, we're going to end Zoom here and take a break for about an hour. We'll start back off a little bit before 7. Next time. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Was there a question? Yes, not tonight's right. session, but the uh, tying session will be on our YouTube channel. Because mm -hmm. I spend the summer in Idaho. Those guys use those red, Go black, ahead. And white zebra mints. Yeah, yeah. So they went just like that. I wonder how you're doing that. But he had a whole lot. Yep. Where's that flat? Okay, wing here, so let me ask. Hang on to that question over here. Yep. The Sparkle Wing RS2, what was the wing material? What, what, what was the question? I got one on the next Friday. I got both of mine. It's called Ribbon Floss. Oh. I got mine to get that far. Well, we'll sign up yep, for it's called uh, Ribbon Floss and Secret.